Let's go to where we stop from. Laptop. Okay. So why um, strategic feeding? With the diagnosis of cleft lip or palate, parents are confronted with feeding difficulties, and these feeding difficulties becomes a major problem. The difficulty is usually because of an impairment of the suction mechanism resulting from the alteration in the anatomical structures. With a cleft lip, it's hard to make a good seal around the nipple, but with a cleft palate, it's hard to um, create suction. So most of these babies born with um, cleft lip or palate um, don't receive adequate nutrition, which retards growth and also makes them unfit for surgery. And if surgery is delayed, they end up, um, it ends up impacting speech. Let's take a closer look at um, some of those difficulties experienced by um, the babies and their parents. Babies born with cleft lip or palate who are non-syndromic have feeding issues because the alveolar ridge and the um, palate are not intact. Therefore, they cannot compress the nipple or create suction to release the fluid. But they do not have swallowing issues and are physically like other babies. So one of the difficulties experienced by these babies is um, nasal, nasal regurgitation or penetration, where milk comes out from the nose. We say milk coming out from the nose and um, can cause repeated bouts of um, cough and cold and also ear infections. And sometimes the milk actually gets into the lungs which can cause chest infections as well. And generally, this makes um, the baby sickly most of the time. Um, there's also the issue where um, most babies actually, most babies um, take in air when they are feeding. But with cleft babies, um, the air intake is actually excessive, which causes them to feel food quickly, even though they have not received um, adequate quantity of their food, but they feel full. So um, it makes them not to take in the adequate quantity that they need. Also, there's also the issue of fatigue from, um, from um, trying, trying so hard to feed. They expend a lot of energy while feeding because of an exhaustive prolonged feeding. And this causes them to lose weight because they burn up a lot of um, calories. Also, on the other hand, we have um, the discomfort of the mother. That some, of, some mothers are emotionally overwhelmed because of um, the situation of their babies. And um, it makes them not to... Um, put in the effort because they are distracted and sometimes there are some psychosocial issues also. They don't want to feed the baby outside where people are or they don't want to, you know, sometimes they, they detach themselves from the baby because they don't have enough support. Also, um, after the operation, if they finally get to the point where they, op um, they have the surgery, um, they will still have to face um, some post-op feeding issues where the baby has um, a heightened sense of oral sensitivity, which leads to irritability, the baby ends up crying, the wound breaks down, all this boils down to um, the baby not taking um, enough feed. Um, so what are the feeding options, the evidence-based feeding options that are available to them? It is important to note, my slide is, sorry, one minute. How do I take um, this off the screen? Admit, see waiting room, control. How do I move it off the screen? Ignore that, it's only you who can see it. The participants are not seeing it. Oh, perfect. Okay. 
So it is important to note that no feeding method is successful with every baby. And post-op feeding methods vary depending on the protocols that are adopted in the centers. Therefore, it's best to evaluate which method actually works best on individual basis. Before surgery, um, breastfeeding is an option for cleft lip, even bottle feeding, but for um, cleft palate, it's usually not an option for them because it's more difficult to breastfeed when there is a palate, most times is almost impossible, but I don't want to use the word impossible. So if breastfeeding is not achieving the desired outcome, it may be necessary to use a bottle or a syringe, spoon and, and cup. And um, some, some feeding method um, studies that were done preferred um, squeezable bottles to the rigid bottle, preferred um, syringe to spoon and cup. Studies also suggest that for post-op, tube feeding from the first 24 hours to a few days um, to a few days is acceptable before the introduction of um, breast or bottle feeding. And some centers actually adopt protocols in which the breast and the bottle feeding are prohibited for a period of 30 days. So let's look at um, the different types of um, feeding bottles that these parents can buy if um, bottle feeding becomes an option. Feeding may work better using special bottles or nipples with a wider base. Below are four special feeding bottles widely accepted for babies born with cleft. One is the Mid Johnson um, Nessa. The bottle is um, soft, it's squeezable, and um, it works well with a variety of nipples. The only disadvantage is that it requires some practice, but most of them requires practice. You need to check the flow rates before you, you know, you, you need to check the flow rate squeeze and see what the flow rate is like, maybe into your palm or in a, in a bowl or in a cup, whatever but most of them requires practice too. So it it's, um, requires practice to coordinate um, the suck and swallow and the breathing pattern of the baby because the, the mother has to squeeze while the baby is attempting to suck as well. Okay, the next one is... Um, the Midella Haberman Special Needs Feeder. With this, um, at the knee pool, there are three different lines, and each line indicates um, the flow rate that is in force. So um, the flow rate can be varied by moving the lines on the knee pool to align with the baby's nose. The short line is for no feed. The, mid, the medium line is for medium flow and um, the longer line is for a faster flow. So you can actually um, vary or regulate depending on um, how fast or how slow you want to go. But we know that most times the babies can't um, swallow um, as fast. So you need to take things easy. It does not require suction. Um, it just requires a short squeeze every three to four socks the baby makes. The next one is the Dr. Brown's specialty feeding system with a one-way valve. The one-way valve keeps the um, nipple filled So the one-way valve um, keeps the nipple filled with milk and it does not require suction. Though you, you may have to um, hold on to the nipple with your thumb and the index finger to expel the air, 
um, turn it upside down and release so that the milk gets into the nipple. You may have to also do it like one or two, um, two or three times to get to the point where the nipple is almost full for you to use it. The next one is the pigeon feeder. This pigeon feeder works with any type of bottle. Um, it has two, um, it comes with a one-way valve also, which has two sizes. And the smaller one is for newborns and it's slower, um, while the uh, faster one is for babies um, greater than six weeks and it does not require squeezing. So let's look at the strategies that these mothers need to learn in order to feed their babies without stress. First, because of nasal, nasal regurgitation and penetration, um, the baby should be fed in an upright position, whether it is from the breast or from the bottle or cup. You can see a picture of, uh, a baby, of two babies being fed. This is a newborn while the other one is um, some few months older baby. So the baby should be fed in an upright position so that the milk goes into the stomach and not into the nose. You also want to position the nipple in the, um, in the side where there is no cleft or cut um, so that um, it doesn't get into the nose. That's, that's the whole idea, feeding the baby so that it doesn't get into the nose. And um, you, you can also use a pacifier to train the baby, to help the baby develop the skills that they need for sucking. So that after the surgery, it would be easy for them. Okay, the baby should also um, take four tablespoons of milk, four tablespoons of milk for every half kilogram of the baby's weight. So if the baby weighs, for example, four kg, the baby should take um, 32 spoons daily to ensure that um, nutrition is adequate. Also, the baby should be fed in small and frequent doses and um, the feeding time should be limited to 20 to 30 minutes. Like we said before, that the babies take in excessive air while feeding before the um, operation. Um, it requires bopping the baby every five minutes because of this, um, so that, the baby, so that um, space can be created for the baby to continue feeding. Also, after feeding, you need to um, keep the baby upright or seated for 20 to 30 minutes after each meal. So, what if they can't find the bottle or they can't afford the bottle? If they are going to use an ordinary feeding bottle. Remember we said that breastfeeding is not an option for cleft babies. So if they're going to use an ordinary feeding bottle, they need to um, boil the bottle and the nipple so that it becomes softer and they can easily squeeze and help the baby because baby can't suck. So um, you need to make them softer so that you can control the flow of the liquid. Also, you can um, cut the nipple. You should cut, not even can, you should cut the nipple into a small X to increase the flow rate. Even though you shouldn't do it, it shouldn't be done um, too much and you must keep checking it because over time the hole may rip and get too large. So what happens when um, the baby um, shows signs of difficulty in breathing during feeding? Um, what happens when um, the breathing pattern changes or you see the baby choking or coughing, kicking or stretching his arms and his legs? If the baby shows signs of stress during feeding, all you have to do is give the baby some time until the baby looks ready to start again. But remember, as you want to remove the nipple, you need to um, turn it down, tilt it, and um, 
point it down as you remove so that you don't get uh, milk into the nose. But if the baby shows signs of stress during every meal, then I think it's about time to bring her to the doctor. So how do we assess, how can the mother know that um, a feeding method is actually working for the baby? Why is it necessary? It is necessary to determine that it is effective so that you can take action when necessary. Basic growth assessment will involve plotting a growth chart. With the, um, with the periodical or regular uh, measurements of the child's weight and height. For simply keeping a record, you can get a book and keep a record and compare it with the standard. Babies can be a range of sizes, but the cost of development actually tends to be predictable and that's why um, the WHO has established standards for infant and child growth. During the first few days of life it's normal for um, both breastfed and bottle fed babies or newborns to lose weight. The bottle fed babies will lose five percent while the um, breastfed ones will lose up to ten percent but after about two weeks they get back to their um, normal birth weight and so here's what to expect in the first 12 months of life. This is the WHO growth chart that can be printed out and um, kept in the ordinary simple um, recording book that the mother has. So the mother can always um, compare with these standards and know if the baby is actually um, making any improvements or the feeding method is actually working for the baby. At this junction, I would like to also um, ask you to go to the Smile Train website and watch the, the beautiful feeding video they have there. It will really help to um, sync all these things that I have said in. So a big thank you to Smile Train, to Kate Crowley, who has been wonderful in teaching us all these things that we, we, we have shared, that have shared with you. And also to all those who make our time to feed the internet. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, that was a very wonderful lecture. Uh, we appreciate you very much, Mrs. Mwamaka. Is the Anoche. That's quite very interesting, very educative, quite very detailed. So we appreciate it very much. Um, we we now I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Um maybe we take some time to look at to look at the slide. First, or do we go straight to the question? Oh, okay. okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we can look at the slides later and go straight to the questions. Um, we have a few questions here. The first question is. Okay. Hello, this is Uwamaka. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Please, I believe you are very ready, you know, for us now to go through the questions. You yes, have some yes. questions here already. Yes. Um, one is here. What is the implication of the feeding challenges on subsequent speech development as well as speech therapy for the child? Okay, the feeding challenges is because um, the, the child will not um, develop oral motor skills. Um, if, the, if there is a, a cleft, a hole in the palate, the child will not be able to 
make those high pressure sounds. And if the baby is not being fed adequately, the baby is, the child is not going to have the surgery. There will be no surgery. So I think that's one of the implications of um, not having um, good nutrition and proper goods. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, another question here is, how do you deal with failure to type, especially for syndromic infants? Okay. For um, syndromic infants, you need to um, take into consideration the different syndromes. Um, what exactly they can do, like they can or cannot do. Like some of the infants who um, who um, have neurological issues, um, you know, you 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 we have the special feeding bottles. They really need some specialized um, feeders to be able to feed properly. Most times when they have those, um, they usually don't have any problem feeding if you have the right bottles or the right tools. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question on aspiration. I'm, I'm having difficulty here uh, to locate it again. I don't know whether you saw the question. Okay, let me, let me look at the chat. Okay, now how best can aspiration be avoided when feeding, especially for babies with cleft palate? Sorry, can you repeat that question again? Okay, how best can aspiration be avoided when feeding, especially for babies with the cleft palate? You need to go slow. Feed slow. Go slow. Go slow, yes. Go, go slow and um, feeding also in the upright position also helps. Okay, thank you very much. I'm trying to, you know, scroll for more questions. Yeah, I think there is a question too on how can maybe mother's gut be those deep um, feeding bottles you, you know, illustrated with in your lecture. Okay, how they can get them? Yes. Um, they can be ordered um, from Amazon. I saw a few in Amazon, so they can, they can make some others. We, we're doing a lot of online shopping now, so it's quite easy to get them if you can afford them. But we also said that if they can't afford them, there are still some other options, just like um, um, boiling the, the bottles, um, boiling the nipple as well to make them softer, making, um, increasing the flow rate by making a cut, an X cut on the nipple. And also, um, we also have the option of using syringes, we have the option of using a spoon. So you just need to know that when you are feeding with the nipple, you need to get the nipple away from the hole and point, you need to tilt it a little bit up so that the milk just flows in naturally and point it down so that it doesn't get up into the nursing. Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much. We really appreciate you very much. The issue is, of course, um, you have planned very well your lecture. It's quite very detailed. Has also provided necessary answers for many questions I believe our colleagues would have wanted to, you know, ask. So it's very, very interesting having you this morning. We appreciate you. you. And um, yeah, there are commendations again for you for that, your beautiful lecture. Thank you very much. We appreciate you.
Professor, Professor Julius, before you close up, I have seen there are two more questions that have come in. Uh, but I would want to try and play the Smile Train video that uh, our speaker referenced to with your permission. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm told the audio is not playing, so I will just type the link on the chat and we can all watch. It's a seven minutes video, it's very brief. And then we, you can watch at your free time. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, well, incident that I couldn't, I couldn't see the questions, but then I don't know whether this is. I see the question. Can she see this? Spend a little time with us to explain or answer the question. Sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, I understand there are two more questions, but then. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello? Hello. Uh, yeah, Esther told us there are two more questions, but then I'm having some difficulty in finding the questions. But then I don't know whether you've been able to read the questions on your own screen. If you've been able to do that, can you please explain them? Okay. Or answer them. Okay. The question is, is there any special protocol in feeding a severely malnourished cleft child yeah okay i've seen it thank you very much can you please answer that okay for a severely malnourished cleft child um the protocol will be to um thicken the feeds you you want to add um partial um feeds to Special feed thickness, like um, other things, to thicken the milk, um, to um, beef it up, so that um, the child can um, have that. Basically, it has to do with the nutritional aspect. So, okay. Are you? Thank you very much. Well, I've also seen another question. I don't know whether it's you question really um a comment yeah it reads thank you you know for the beautiful lecture the bottle is very costly and hard to get and also we have problems with the mothers keeping the bottles clean and sterilized sometimes it is the source of infection but in all the bottle has been helpful i think um it's just, you know, an additional information, a piece of additional information to what we have provided. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's really the question. Yeah, and like, like I said, um, there are so many options. If they can keep the bottle keep clean, they can use um, a cup uh, and a spoon, and um, they can, you can ask them to boil 
for them in Portugal for about 10 minutes. I wish we were able to see the video then. That should help to answer that. Okay. Yeah, I think Esther mentioned that she's going to, you know, type the link or also that we can watch the video later. Esther, are you able to do that? Uh, let me, I've been given a pointer. I have very many people who are helping me out here. Let me see whether I can play the audio. <laughs> oh, you want to play reggae? Uh, Okay. I've been told at the bottom left of the screen. Give me one minute. I will be able to do this. Roof of their mouths. Men or a hole in the roof of the mouth. Professor, can you hear this? This is sound a very now? common birth defect. But in the hands of a good surgeon, yes, you can get this be corrected, now. and that too, totally free. The hole in the roof of the mouth may not be visible from outside, but must be closed. If not done at the right age, this will prevent the child from speaking properly when he grows up. There may also be other problems such as milk and food coming out of the nose, as well as repeated bouts of cough and cold and other chest and ear infections, making the child fall sick frequently. The only way to close the hole in the roof of the mouth is through surgery. And to make the child fit and strong for that surgery, they need to be fed adequately. Mother's milk is like nectar for the child. There is no food better for the child than mother's milk. But because of the hole in the roof of their mouths, many such children are not able to take in milk properly. Instead, they suck in a lot of air. And even though they feel full, they haven't received adequate milk. Sometimes, it comes out through the nose or could even go into their lungs. Because of the extra effort, many children tire easily and fall asleep. And the mother feels the child has taken the full feed and gone to sleep. In this video, we will show mothers how to feed such children. The best way is to feed the child directly from the breast. For this, the mother needs to hold the child upright so that the milk goes into the stomach instead of coming out through the nose or going to the lungs. The nipple should be directed towards the side of the mouth that does not have a cut. Since the baby is not able to suck with enough force, the mother should simultaneously squeeze her breast to increase the flow of milk. But do this gently. Sometimes these children may not be able to swallow the milk if it comes too fast and some of it could come out of their mouth. If this happens, stop and slow down. With a little practice, the mother and child can set a flow rate that the child can handle and both will soon adjust to one another. These children also suck in a lot of air as they are taking in the milk and need to be burped more often. For that, put the baby on your shoulder and gently rub his back down up until you hear a burping sound. This needs to be done a few times during feeding and at the end of feeding. If for any reason feeding from the breast does not work, the mother can also expel her milk from the breast into a container and feed with a spoon or through a bottle. Special feeding containers are available at some places and these can be used. Or you can enlarge the hole in the teat of a feeding bottle to increase the flow of milk. The mother must make sure the container, spoon and bottle are clean and sterilized. For this, they must be kept in boiling water for at least 10 minutes. Feeding through unclean containers, spoons and bottles can lead to infections and fever. 
If the mother is simply unable to feed her own milk for any reason, the next best thing is to give cow's milk or formula milk. This is clearly not the best, but if mother's milk is just not available, the child can be fed with these. It is very important that the cow's milk is pre-boiled and cooled and then fed with a spoon or through a bottle. It should never be diluted. If using formula milk from a tin, make sure the water used is absolutely clean and preferably boiled. After boiling the water, let it cool before mixing with the powdered milk. Make sure the proportions of powdered milk in water is exactly as recommended. Feeding dilute milk will not give the child the nutrition needed to become fit for surgery. It is worth repeating, please make sure all containers, spoons and bottles you use are clean and sterilized. If the child is just unable to take any form of milk, he should be started on soft food and cereals as early as possible. But for this, you must consult a doctor at a smile train center without any delay. How will you know if the feeding is going well and the child growing normally? The easiest way is to take the child to the nearest smile train center regularly for a checkup. But if that is not possible, you should regularly monitor the baby's weight, keep a record and show it to the doctor at a smile train center. All such visits at any smile train center are totally free. Once the child is old and strong enough to undergo surgery, the doctors at the smile train center will once again carefully examine the child and advise when to come to the hospital. Please follow their advice. They know best. Remember, the entire treatment from the first visit right through surgery and follow-up treatment will be totally free at any smile train center. And after treatment, your child will become like any other child. Have a perfectly normal childhood and grow up into a fine young adult. Smile Train takes care of hundreds of thousands of such children around the world every year. But this would not be possible without the mother's cooperation. Please persevere and have patience. Smile Train is always with you.